hear no, nothing. So then we continue with Carl Johnston uh, spicing up solid state physics with radioactive isotopes. Recent highlights from his holding. Carl, are you here? Yes, I'm here. So no. uh, I just uh, hang on to that. Share my screen. Uh, switch. Okay, you should see some kind of talk now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for staying around to, to hear this talk. So this will be a little bit of an overview talk of uh, how we can spice up solid-state physics with radioactive isotopes. You've already heard a little bit from Gerda and uh, quite an in-depth uh, overview of the MUSBAR program uh, from, from Krish. Uh, and this will be an introduction and a, a flavor of some recent results uh, from other techniques which are widely used at is for solid state physics. Um, it will be a, a great uh, privilege to be in South Africa at the moment. It's a very gloomy, wet day in Geneva with the promise of snow later today. So I wouldn't I wouldn't mind swapping a hemisphere at the moment. But here we see Isolde you know, back in the summertime uh, and when it was nice and sunny. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge a few people before we start the talk. So Juliana Schell is the current solid state coordinator at Isolde and uh, has helped to, pre uh, to uh, prepare some of the data, which is going to be shown in these slides. Guillaume Correa uh, from, uh, from Lisbon is a long-term uh, resident, you might say, at Isolde for solid state physics and has also helped with the preparation of some of the data. And George Marshik, uh, a new master's student, has managed to prepare some very nice data, which he pre presented at last week's Isolde workshop, in which I also highlight here. <clears throat> and indeed, all the different groups in solid state physics at Isolde should be acknowledged as well. And um, the funding for this work has come historically mainly from three different sources, from Belgium, from Germany, and from Portugal. And the bulk of the uh, uh, funding has come really from the uh, the BMBF in, in Germany, who have really supported this research over the last 30 years with the addition of new spectrometers, uh, new collection chambers, and indeed offline labs. Uh, really, did. without this support, this, this science wouldn't be possible. So the overview of the talk is here. We will just quickly go through some aspects of solid state physics in general, and then we will start going radioactive. Uh, why do we uh, combine the two uh, methods? Why do we apply radioactive methods to solid state physics? Then some of the techniques and examples of recent uh, results will be, will be shown as well. So just some aspects of solid state physics, which if you're coming from a, a nuclear side, you might not be uh, so aware, uh, but nonetheless, you should probably have uh, at least encountered some of these issues uh, during uh, various studies. Uh, and I suppose the for semiconductors, uh, some of the central questions all relate back to doping. Uh, can you make something N-type or P-type and, and there, therefore lead towards a device? So in silicon, for example, you put in boron or phosphorus to make it uh, P or N-type respectively. Um, understanding what actually produces these doping properties in a semiconductor can be surprisingly complex. The, the textbook examples of just uh, substituting one atom for another uh, doesn't usually work quite so easily in practice. Uh, we already saw from Gerda's talk uh, on the, the thorium clock uh, that uh, part of this program is understanding the lattice location of the uh, implanted actinium in the calcium fluoride crystal. Uh, and this is also, this is derived from uh, the solid state physics, uh, you might say motivation for understanding what produces doping in, in crystals. Um, back in the earlier days, most of the activities were concentrated on single crystal materials such as silicon, but increasingly we are now into compound semiconductors such as uh, gallium nitride, zinc oxide, uh, cadmium telluride materials such as this. And gallium nitride, you will know, is the uh, material which is in LED light bulbs. It's the one that got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Uh, and although we have some understanding of the, um, the chemistry behind uh, producing the doping in these materials, some of the physics and some of the precise uh, uh, knowledge of lattice location uh, and exactly what is producing, especially p-type uh, uh, conductivity in these materials is still not fully known, which has an impact on the longevity of devices, etc. So uh, this is things which are still uh, relevant questions. Uh, and how do, what do we want to learn? We want to discover what element or defect, because it can be sometimes an element or sometimes just a defect, uh, an absence of a, a host 
uh, atom which produces the doping? Uh, where does this sit in the lattice? So these are the kind of questions we're trying to answer. Another class of materials are multiferroic materials, which uh, is beginning to constitute quite a large part of our program now at Isolde. Here's the example of uh, bismuth ferrite. And these are quite complex materials, which have many different uh, lattice configurations, which is possible. Uh, and there's a lot of um, efforts now to try and understand what form of a material produces a, a particular effect. I will show another slide in a minute, uh, showing some of the properties that these materials exhibit and how they could be useful for um, very energy efficient uh, memory storage and things like this. Uh, but the, these materials adopt different structures as you go along different uh, temperatures uh, and understanding exactly what's going on inside these materials and what phases are present uh, at a particular time is crucial to be able to start producing devices with these in the future. And of course, um, inspired by graphene and other low dimensional materials, uh, there's a campaign also to understand the surface studies of low dimensional materials such as graphene, such as uh, uh, tungsten selenide, uh, and the electronic and magnetic properties of these is a, a relevant question at the moment as well. In terms of the materials which are being studied, so here is a leading on from some of what Chris was talking about, uh, uh, a diamond crystal with a uh, a carbon replaced by a nitrogen atom, uh, and here's a, a V, which means a vacancy, so this is basically a carbon atom has been removed, and this is what we call the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. Um, when I was doing my PhD, we used to call these defects in diamond, but uh, that's no longer sexy enough, so now these have become quantum bits, uh, because it has been realized about 15 years ago that uh, the nitrogen vacancy center has the promise to be a, a quantum bit for uh, future applications involving spintronics and uh, metrology and very uh, sensitive uh, sensing applications. Um, and this is now a whole program, uh, the European flagship devoted to understanding the, uh, uh, the quantum nature of some of these uh, centers. So there's a quite a dynamic uh, collaboration now trying to understand some of these, not just for nitrogen vacancy, but also for other uh, elements as well, which might be more efficient for uh, optical uh, applications. Uh, here we come back to multiferroic materials, and here you see some riddled and uh, popper materials where you can stack them up in various uh, uh, layers, producing perovskite layers, which can, can be quite efficient for energy uh, applications. And here you see the different range of uh, effects that these materials can adopt, uh, ranging from the ferroelectric to the ferroelastic, ferromagnetic, uh, and then combinations of all these different effects can be mediated as well, which can potentially lead to very uh, interesting devices in the future if we understand some of the physics of what's going on inside these materials as well. And here we see a recent um, uh, proposal which was accepted, looking at, uh, again, for the quantum uh, information uh, uh, regime, uh, trying to adapt uh, a well-known superconductor, so ni niobium nitride, which is quite a low temperature uh, TC, uh, but has some potential applications for uh, quantum information as well. So you can see that there's a quite a, a wide range of materials being uh, considered at Isolde, uh, in addition to a, quite a wide scientific program in general. So how can radioactive ion beams help for the study of these materials? Uh, so we try to uh, exploit some of the unique features of radioactive ions uh, for solid state applications. Uh, the first thing, which is of course, um, quite easy to, I suppose, discuss is that it's chemically selective. We can implant a specific radioactive isotope in, into a material, and from this we can play some games with the, the chemistry of the material to try and understand uh, some of the processes inside. As we saw from Chris's talk, uh, these are very sensitive techniques. Uh, you don't need very many probe atoms to get a result uh, at the other end, um, either for tracer diffusion kind of experiments where you implant something and then monitor the half-life, or for hyperfine techniques, such as MOSP or other techniques, uh, you can get away with very, very few probe atoms. And this is increasingly becoming quite desirable uh, for, the, for the probing of subtle effects inside materials. Uh, you can also play games with the depth distribution. You can control the ion energy uh, into the material, and you can go beyond some certain diffusion limits, which are not easily uh, possible with other techniques. And you get this local magnetic and electrical field information, which is not always so uh, extractable using other techniques as well. And as we saw in Gerda's talk, uh, with the emission channeling technique, which I will come back to later, you can get very precise uh, information on where uh, atoms and chemis chemical elements are residing inside a host lattice. So that's just the, uh, the overview. There are why radioactive probes, it's sensitive, selective and controllable, and it's a local uh, probe of an environment as well. It should be also noted that it's also often relatively easy for facilities such as these older to produce these uh, ion beams. 
Um, we saw it from Gerda's talk that she was talking about some uh, of the laser spectroscopy and the precise precision measurements, which were running at point, uh, point 0.5 or so ions per second. Uh, for radioactive ion, for, for solid state physics, we often want up to the order of 10 million or 100 million ions per second. So it can be somehow, sometimes difficult to balance the uh, requirements of nuclear physics and the solid state physicists. But I think uh, at Isolde, we've managed to uh, combine this in a fairly harmonious way over the last few years where uh, we go to the very exotic for nuclear physics, but we can also use less exotic probes for very uh, interesting fundamental science in the areas of, of solid state physics. And this is just a quick overview of, again, some of these, uh, the nature of, uh, or, or the amount of ions you would wish to introduce into a material to get a useful spectrum. And basically the, the take home message here is that you really from 10 to the 10, 10 to the uh, 12 ions per second or uh, uh, ions in total allows you to achieve measurements for uh, electrical spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, emission channeling, uh, MOS bar effect, perturbed angular correlation, which makes it very uh, desirable. It means you can basically uh, do collections. I put activity into a sample in, in a matter of minutes or maybe half an hour at most, uh, which then allows us to do the, the offline spectroscopy uh, to study just the, the nature of the, the material itself. And we should also see just, uh, this is just something to mention in passing, if we look at classical NMR, uh, so this is often used for biophysical applications, you can see the number of probes you have to introduce into the sample is around 10 to the 18, whereas if we use the, uh, the, the slightly more subtle version of this, which is beta NMR, which is a, uh, through the, uh, the beta decay process, um, nuclear magnetic resonance, you can see we only need 10 to the 7 ions uh, to get a, a spectrum. So you see here 10, 11 orders of magnitude more sensitive, and this has some potential uh, very exciting applications for biophysics, which I won't really mention today, but I'll just introduce for those who are interested. So here's the nuclear chart for Isolde. You've seen this already from, from Gerda's talk. Uh, and as I say, uh, for, for solid state physics, we're not very interested in this sort of 10 to the one, 10 to the three ions per second. We become interested around here where the yields are typically around uh, 10 to the seven at least, or even 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine, which allows us to basically uh, produce a radioactive sample, which we can measure in a, in a matter of seconds, minutes, or half an hour or so. And here's just the overview of the techniques which are available at Isolde at the moment. Uh, so we've already heard from Chris about the Mosbar effect. Uh, there are two other techniques which uh, exploit the hyperfine interaction. Uh, the main one I'll talk about today is uh, uh, angular correlation or perturbed angular correlation techniques. Nuclear magnetic resonance is also available. I, I won't mention this today very much. Uh, exploiting radioactive decay properties, we have uh, optical uh, spectroscopy such as photoluminescence and then electrical characterization techniques such as DLTS and the uh, Hall effect and also just plain tracer diffusion where you monitor the diffusion profile in the material uh, is a very direct application of, uh, of, of, the, of the radioactive decay and can be very powerful for understanding complex diffusion processes and materials and then finally the Coulomb interaction can be exploited for emission channeling and then this can then feed back into many different uh, solid state physics, life sciences, and various other applications as well. So here's the, the periodic table uh, of Isolde elements which have been used for solid state physics. Um, we have certain workhorse probes, those 57 manganese is the one we heard from Mossbauer. Here are the hyperfine probes which are used at least once or twice a year for solid state physics, 111 cadmium, 199 mercury. Uh, 117 cadmium, also 73 arsenic can be quite uh, desirable for these some, for some solid state physics studies. Um, but it's also being able to choose a radioactive isotope allows us to look at the decay properties. Uh, and you can see in addition to these workhorse probes where you might say guaranteed uh, beam times are available every year, we have more niche applications which have basically covered the whole periodic table. Um, and it should also be noted that the, <clears throat> the solid state uh, community have have been a driver also in the development of new beams at Isolde. It's not just that we uh, uh, take what is available. We have also been uh, one of the key drivers for the development of, say, the laser ion source, which came online around 1994, 95, and the first successful beams of this were the 57 manganese, which was uh, used for, for the Musbar rooms. Uh, so here's just an overview of uh, some uh, techniques, what they look like in, in the lab. Um, uh, Musbar effect you saw, here is this kind of uh, it's, uh, it's cousin, you might say, perturbed angular correlation. And here you see a similar sort of decay uh, uh, scheme to what we saw for, 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 for Musbauer. Here we go through a, a double gamma cascade. 
And it's this intermediary state here with uh, the half-life of 84 uh, odd uh, nanoseconds, which is sensitive to the local environment, as we saw for the MUSPower setup. Um, and here's the example of 111 cadmium, but other isotopes are available. Uh, here you see a modern version of this spectrometer uh, where everything is digitized uh, and it's a small uh, sample uh, is held inside six different detectors which are arranged around it here. Um, and these techniques are very, very sensitive to the local environment of the material or indeed protein if you're doing biophysics. And especially uh, interactions such as magnetic interactions can be uh, deciphered. You saw this with Chris's talk where we did nature of magnetism in zinc oxide was unraveled and magnetic interactions in materials such as multiferroics is becoming more and more desirable to understand these on a very local uh, uh, <clears throat> interaction scale. They also they are sensitive to dynamical processes, the quite short-lived half-life days, so we can see chemical processes which are uh, blind to other uh, typical techniques and we have very intense and often unique beams available at Isola, so it's quite a nice uh, 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 over uh, possibilities available uh, for these um, techniques. For, um, also, for uh, here we just show an example of the, the beta NMR setup, which is currently being installed in the hall for biophysics, where we basically explore the, the polarized beams which decay using uh, beta decay. Uh, and this will be now used next year for understanding uh, biological systems in uh, using the beta decay uh, beams available. And for emission channeling, uh, we saw some spectra from Gerda already. Uh, and the main attraction for this, again, it's a sensitivity. It's uh, able to probe uh, very uh, sensitively uh, materials with very low concentrations. It's four orders of magnitude more sensitive than uh, its, its counterpart, Rutherford backscattering. And it's less limited in terms of um, uh, implanted beams. And here you see an example of uh, an online chamber, but I'll come back to this later. And uh, just a quick flash of two traditional techniques. So this is a, a, a tracer diffusion where beams are implanted onto a material uh, and then we can uh, anneal the sample. So basically cook it for a certain temperature uh, and then remove layers of the surface, which are then measured using a gamma spectrum, uh, a germanium detector, which allows us to measure the activity of each removed slice. And from this, you can build up a picture of the uh, uh, diffusion process inside the material and here we are see an optical spectrometer for photoluminescence which is a very classical setup but which uh, once you start looking at the half-lives of the planted materials allows you to get chemical selectivity which is not usually available otherwise. So this is just the, uh, the overview of these all the hall. As Gerda said we are mo mostly uh, confined to two beam lines here which are basically where we do collections or certain online experiments uh, and instead of doing most of our work inside the these all the hall we do the bulk of our measurements underneath the Isolde control room, which is housed in the neighboring building here, building 508. Um, and we basically transport our samples up the stairs into the offline labs. And you see what these look like here. Uh, this is an example of the, the chemistry lab that we have for preparing samples and also for biological measurements. Here we see some um, uh, evaporators for preparation of uh, contacts uh, and various other, uh, maybe applying tin films to some materials. And here you see some of the measuring uh, labs for perturbing correlation. Uh, here you see the more analog spectrometers compared to what I just showed you in the previous slide, where instead of everything digitized with uh, five or six cards, uh, we have a few kilometers of cable for delays, uh, delaying signals and also for wiring up all the different uh, uh, modules as well. So we have different generations of, of spectrometers which are used uh, according to which material we want to uh, study. And here you just see the, the thermal treatment room where we can basically play some annealing tricks uh, to recover uh, or to uh, repair damage, which is introduced during the ion implantation process. So just some one result from Radio Tracer PL, and it's already quite a while ago, but this activity is beginning to start up again, and hopefully will be fully uh, uh, in business for the physics program next year. But here we see again, zinc oxide, which was a very hot topic uh, about uh, 10 to five to 10 years ago, uh, where Many properties were predicted, but uh, in the end, uh, its, its promise began to uh, fade away. Nonetheless, uh, uh, experiments at Isolde helped to, helped to unravel some of these uh, uh, properties of this material. We saw from Krish about magnetism properties, and here we were looking at some uh, optical features uh, related to donors inside the uh, uh, zinc oxide material. And here we implanted a, a very short-lived silver beam, which had a, a half-life of only 0.78 seconds, which went through cadmium, indium, tin, and finally to stable antimony. And we were able to basically unravel the nature of uh, tin uh, donors inside zinc oxide 
and also uh, uh, we, we discovered the first antimony related optical feature in this material and you can see this here hopefully some yeah here you can see the uh, uh, the decay of uh, a very weak line here but it decays with a half-life characteristic of a tin 121 and we see the growth of a new feature related to the the, the, the daughter isotope of antimony which is stable here you can see it growing in and this featured in applied physics letters uh, seven years ago and we hope now to reactivate this uh, activity uh, for the studying of, uh, of, of, of centers in, in diamonds. Um, here is just a quick overview of the perturbative correlation uh, setups. Again, uh, I've already shown you these two spectrometers. This is the digitized PAC spectrometer and the old analog version. Completely unique to Isolde is uh, you know, the ability to do electron gamma uh, spectroscopy. So uh, mostly we do gamma-gamma uh, gamma correlations, but we also have the possibility to do electron gamma using uh, conversion electrons and uh, related to the gamma cascade. Uh, and this is the only spectrometer in the world capable of doing this. Right? This can be uh, very important also for unraveling more subtle effects uh, in materials. Uh, and here are some of the parameters that you can extract from this. I won't go into this in too much detail. It's very similar to what you can extract from uh, uh, from MOSPAR spectroscopy, but it's basically the electrical field gradient uh, and the quadrupole interaction and uh, combined magnetic interactions allows you to understand the hyperfine uh, uh, nature of what's going outside the, uh, the material. One disadvantage of perturbed angular correlation is that we're not sensitive to the, the chemical shifts, so we don't have a nice isomer uh, parameter to give us uh, this information, but we are a bit more flexible uh, in terms of what we can do uh, uh, in terms of housing the spectrometers. We are less limited by temperature and the environment, so this allows us to go from liquid helium temperatures all the way up to uh, 1,200 degrees Celsius, for example. Uh, we can also run experiments inside a magnetic field. Uh, we can do surface science experiments. We can do it for biology. Just, it's a very wide, a very adaptable technique to be able to study a, a large amount of, of uh, materials. And here is just the overview of the uh, periodic chart of hyperfine parameters. Uh, so Chris showed you the uh, the MOSPAR equivalent of this. So M is for MOSPAR spectroscopy. But here you see the many different opportunities for gamma, gamma, gamma electron, PAC, uh, with the various isotopes here uh, and of course the, the the workhorse probes will be the like of cadmium mercury um hafnium uh, which is here and various other ones as well uh, silver can also be quite quite uh, uh, desirable uh, and in the uh, the rare earths we have some very nice ones which could be uh, interesting too uh, and a recent isotope which is going to come online next year is very short-lived copper uh, which will uh, uses a copper 68 state uh, which will be adapted for online PAC next year uh, which some new proposals being uh, prepared for the, the next meeting of the FTC. So just some uh, results uh, on these techniques. Uh, I come back to the multi that I showed you earlier. Uh, as I say, these are quite complex materials. So this is a result from earlier this year, which was published in PhysRev B uh, on calcium manganates. Uh, so this is a combined experimental and ab initio theory or study uh, combining a perturbative correlation uh, results uh, from Isolde and detailed ab initio density functional calculations uh, to understand the, the, the theoretical parameters of what's going on. And this is becoming more and more uh, vital that uh, we have to combine experiment and theory to really understand the processes. And here we see uh, examples of these uh, manganate materials which can adopt many different phases, many different structural uh, configurations according to different temperatures. And here I hope you can see a little bit the, uh, the difference in temperature uh, so this is 11 Kelvin, uh, so we have a very characteristic spectrum here. And if you go up to 1200 Kelvin, uh, you can see that the, uh, the resonance or the, uh, <clears throat> the decay uh, spectrum is quite different between the two uh, different temperatures. And basically this study was uh, trying to understand some processes in these materials from very low to high temperatures to understand uh, some phases which apparently linger rather longer than expected. Uh, and this main result from this paper was that uh, phase clusters. So basically, uh, the, the material is adopting two different phases uh, simultaneously. You can see it here in this in this graph here, where there's one phase uh, lingering up to 500 degrees Celsius, and another phase hasn't quite uh, dominated until after 500 degrees Celsius. I uh, know, uh, sorry, Kelvin. And um, so this was um, uh, again unraveling very subtle effects inside these rather complex materials uh, using the, uh, the angular correlation technique, uh, and allows people to understand better how to treat these experiment these materials if you actually want to start making a device exploiting the uh, the ferroelectric 
properties of this calcium manganate materials. Uh, similar results for bismuth ferrite, which is again another multifluoric material are shown here. And this is just an example of what the, the sensitivity of these, uh, uh, of, of this technique to temperature. Here you can see 800 degrees uh, going up to 850 degrees. So this is not a huge uh, change in temperature, but you can see at 800 degrees already uh, at 804, 807, 810, you can see new uh, features beginning to uh, emerge. You can see here a combination of different uh, phases beginning to uh, coexist. And then around 820 degrees or so, it, it undergoes a proper phase transition. And here you can see the second uh, phase now dominates. So you can see the, the sensitivity of these of this technique over the range of uh, even two degrees, you can see um, uh, completely different spectra. Uh, and this is work which has allowed uh, the group in, um, in Essen in Germany to understand some of the, the high, high temperature phases from the alpha and beta phase uh, of, 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 um, of, of bismuth ferrite. Uh, here you can see it very clearly as well. Uh, so this is, uh, again, just a demonstration of some of the, uh, the power of these local probe techniques to understand these are uh, really quite demanding materials. Uh, so this is work from George Marshik's uh, master's physics, uh, uh, master's thesis, and this has been prepared, I think, for a Physrel B paper, hasn't yet been published. Um, in addition to just gamma-gamma correlations, we also have, as I said, the possibility to do electron gamma uh, spectroscopy. Uh, here we see an example from a hafnium, uh, uh, hafnium 181, which has basically the ability to do gamma-gamma PAC and electron gamma. And um, here we see gamma-gamma PAC from uh, low temperatures up to room temperature, we see no difference in, uh, in, in spectra. Whereas if you look at the electron gamma uh, from 12 Kelvin all the way up to uh, 500K or so, you can see a very, very different spectrum is beginning to emerge. And uh, basically this is, uh, uh, shows that uh, just using one technique isn't always enough. If you have the possibility to combine it with another one, uh, it allows you to re reveal more subtle uh, aspects of what's going on inside the material. Uh, and this is the case for this uh, semiconductor, which is, uh, uh, gallium nitride again, uh, which uh, from the gamma gamma the cascades, we weren't able to see anything clearly, uh, but from the electron gamma, we were able to probe uh, the electrical properties of the material, which was basically the introduction of um, a, a double donor system uh, related to thallium, uh, which is, uh, I think, one of the unique aspects of, uh, or one of the unique results of, of this technique to probe not just the local environment, but also uh, some of the more macroscopic qualities, which are basically related to the electrical properties of material. So this paper from last year uh, really uh, was the first indication or the most recent uh, uh, demonstration that perturbing correlation can also reveal bulk properties of materials, which is not usually the case. Often we just look at the local uh, environment, which allows you to look at subtle effects related to uh, where the probe is sitting. Here we really see the uh, the bulk properties being being uh, revealed as well. Um, if I leave behind PAC and move on to emission channeling, uh, I just show you a cartoon of what emission channeling looks like, uh, uh, the, the principles behind it. Uh, so you basically implant a radioactive probe into your material, be it a semiconductor, be it a, a multifluoric material, whatever. But historically, the, the program has focused on semiconductors. Uh, and indeed, Krish, I think his first was, uh, experiments at these all that were related more to the emission channeling side than Muspower. Uh, and this group uh, from, from Germany, which now eventually is, is run mostly from the Lisbon side uh, and Leuven, uh, also involved uh, quite a significant South African input in, in the, over the last 15 years. Here we see what's happening. You can plant the radioactive probe. You maybe do some thermal treatments to repair again some crystal damage. And then you have a two dimensional detector which is aligned at high symmetry uh, directions. Uh, along certain directions, you will see a high uh, electron yield as the uh, decay products are channeled through the crystal lattice. Along other high dimension, or high symmetry directions, it's blocked. So they basically, the electron gets lost and doesn't reach the detector. And basically you see high and low yields for certain uh, crystallographic directions. Here you see an example of one of these two dimensional detectors, um, yeah, what they look like in reality. Uh, and this is a nice also, uh, I would say a nice uh, uh, overview or, pos or yeah, a nice demonstration of what is possible at CERN. So this is a two-dimensional detect detectors which were developed for medical uh, applications for x-ray and for PET scans, the TimePix and MediPix uh, collaborations, uh, and they found a niche application for the uh, use 
uh, for use in emission channeling for solid state physics. And this is just what a, a typical chamber looks like. Beam comes in, it's very finely focused. This is one of the uh, crucial aspects of this uh, uh, technique is that we have to focus the beam to a very, very high precision. So less than one millimeter um, uh, uh, control of, of where we want to do it so that we can have a very high resolution then from the emitted particles. And then you have your two dimensional detector mounted at this 17 degrees uh, to the uh, incoming beam. Uh, and here we see just uh, some results that I will show you on this. So this is uh, again going back to gallium nitride, our LED material. Uh, and this is again un trying to understand some of the, the doping processes inside this material. Um, for many years we know that magnesium is responsible for uh, the doping characteristics in, in gallium nitride, but some of the lattice where, where exactly this is residing inside the material wasn't quite known. Uh, and this was um, unraveled using emission channeling at Isolde a couple of years ago where we were able to understand the interstitial, especially uh, nature of, of ma magnesium isotopes inside gallium nitride in a range of different doped um, nitride, uh, gallium nitride uh, samples. Uh, and it led to uh, uh, the ability to extract the activation energy of the interstitial magnesium, which is uh, quite hard to pin down using other techniques uh, in this energy range, which is crucial then hopefully for uh, being able to control this interstitial magnesium to produce more reliable long-term devices in the future. So this is a, an example of where the physics uh, should ha help to uh, allow better control of the magnesium, which is responsible for the p-type character in gallium nitride, which should uh, lead to slightly improved devices in the future. Also for more recent work, so this is a paper which was published uh, just a few weeks ago in PhysRev Letters. Uh, we go back to color centers and diamond. Uh, are they possible for future quantum bits. So this is the nitrogen vacancy center that I showed you uh, back in the, uh, earlier in the talk. Uh, for a long while, <clears throat> it has been predicted that other, uh, other element vacancy centers are possible, um, especially from theory. Uh, people have simulated uh, different elements such as lead, tin, uh, germanium, etc., even silicon, uh, but also slightly bigger elements are predicted to be uh, sufficiently stable to produce uh, uh, quantum bits, and one of these was uh, tin. Uh, so from theory, it was postulated that uh, tin residing in this kind of double vacancy uh, scenario, so instead of occupying a substitutional site, the tin, because it's a bit larger, would distort the lattice a little bit uh, and force the creation of two different vacancies, uh, but it had never been observed experimentally uh, un unambiguously. But uh, emission channeling work at Isolde from a few years ago uh, allowed the, uh, uh, the pinpointing of, of this uh, uh, tin vacancy center in this uh, split vacancy configuration, uh, but very, very uh, uh, unambiguous results, which were published in PhysRev letters. It also led to the uh, uh, application of uh, uh, the, the same sample, which was implanted at Isolde, was then measured using photoluminescence, and a new feature appears to be coming in as you go deeper and deeper into the material, or, uh, basically as you go, uh, uh, sorry, sorry uh, from the surface into the bulk, we see an, a feature which is uh, diminishing as you go deeper into the material, which is uh, hinting that tin is also producing something which is optically active, which is very exciting for uh, quantum applications. Unfortunately, this is not an unambiguous spectrum. This is only uh, probing different uh, depths of the optical signal. So we hope to do radio tracer PL on this next year. A new proposal was accepted in June, and we hope to uh, uh, be able to really nail this uh, uh, optical system, see if it's really related to tin or not. Uh, and then just some of the new developments which are ongoing at Isolde. Uh, so as I say, the digitizing of uh, spectrometers is an ongoing process. Uh, this is the digital PAC. We are also uh, digitizing the, uh, the MUSBAR setup. So the, the setup that uh, Chris showed you should be replaced by a more digital setup for, for next year, which is currently being uh, finalized. Um, in Germany and will be transported to Isolde hopefully in the spring and hopefully people will be able to come and uh, use it next year as well. Uh, we also see improvements of the two-dimensional detectors for emission channeling. Here you see the older uh, uh, Edipix uh, um, detectors and here you see the newer version which offers a much higher resolution which uh, again allows us to uh, have more possibilities for studying uh, materials. We're also continually to upgrade detectors, spectrometers, data acquisition systems and we are learning a little bit from our nuclear uh, physics colleagues uh, how to use lanthanum bromide, cerium bromide detectors, which again, with our greater en energy resolution, has a, allows us to uh, exploit more probes for uh, 
especially for perturbed angle correlation. And we're also developing a spectrometer for biophysics uh, for muscular spectroscopy. Um, and here you again see some more new chambers which are being developed. This is the new online setup for uh, 68 copper PAC. Here we see a new uh, collection chamber for better control of the uh, implanted energy uh, for general collections for solid state physics. And here we see a brand new chamber which was used in 2018 uh, for implantations on ice, which is the, the basis of how we do uh, chemistry experiments for, for biological uh, experiments, but also allows us to uh, do some wet chemistry with implanted probes, uh, which is kind of a, a nice uh, uh, feature to be able to have. So in summary, uh, I just won't go to too much in detail here, but you can see it yourself. The ability to probe, uh, magnetic properties, and other uh, characteristics of materials in a very dilute and sensitive way is essentially unique to the uh, hyperfine uh, techniques such as perturbed angular correlation and MOS power. Uh, at Isolde, uh, it's becoming extremely attractive to be able to do this. I mean, I would say there's a, a growing demand to be able to, ex to exploit these uh, uh, sensitive uh, properties of our probes. Uh, devices are not getting any bigger, uh, materials are getting smaller, etc., uh, and lower and lower in dimensions. So being able to do these experiments is becoming more and more desirable. Being able to probe uh, some aspects of materials, such as the interface, uh, is otherwise very difficult to do reliably. Um, controlled implantation of radioactive probes would be the ideal tool for this. And again, the flexibility of these techniques uh, to be able to go cover a wide range of temperatures, magnetic fields, uh, and other kind of perturbative studies, for example, chemistry, is very desirable. And if you combine this with more classical you know, spectroscopies, it allows you to build a very powerful image of what's happening in, in, inside materials. And I think with the range of isotopes available, is all that you can always attack problems in materials in a very, very fresh and unique way. And for those who are interested, uh, a few years ago, we published our lab portraits uh, of many different aspects of Isolde. And there's a, an article devoted to the solid state physics program, but also to various other uh, other, um, sorry, my phone just went off, uh, various other experiments that Isolde, and it's while we're checking out this, this um, edition of JFISG, which contains a range of review articles, which brings you up to date on what's happening uh, at Isolde. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Carl, for a beautiful talk, <clears throat> and I thank all three speakers in this first part of the session for really wonderful talks. We are extremely late, but we have enjoyed so much nice physics, so I think everyone just have enjoyed this. Uh, now I will ask Melody to show a little, little video, and after that we take a break, and I think we take the break until 11.15. But first, a video that you should enjoy. Melody, can you do that?